All right, we are back here on The Crash Report. Uh, you can listen to the show anywhere you get podcasts. You can go to our YouTube channel, The Crash Report, to watch uh, clips, highlights, full interviews, and more. And you can hit us up on all social media, at Crash Report Show. Uh, right now, I'm here with Brian Vander Ark of The Verve Pipe. Brian, uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good, man. I, uh, you know, it's funny. I was uh, on your Instagram, and uh, your, your uh, bio says, I sing for The Verve Pipe. We had to hit the freshman not bittersweet symphony, which was the verb, but what the fuck? I take credit for it sometimes. <laughs> Why not? And you know, I was telling a buddy of mine that I was uh, that you were coming onto the show, and I was like, "Yeah, you know the verb pipe, right?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, bittersweet symphony." Oh. And I was like, "No, nah, man, that's uh, that's the <laughs> freshman." Uh, do you get that a lot? I get it every day. <laughs> I get it every goddamn day. I mean, it doesn't bother me. Look, the verb had it worse i'm sure they probably still have it worse but back then you know when message boards were really popular you know i'm sure that a bunch of teeny boppers got on their message boards and like i love the freshman and richard ashcroft's fucking head probably exploded so you know <laughs> who, who cares it's like and you know i have we have yet i think we might have covered it when we did we did kid shows you know we used to, because we put out a couple of kids albums for fun right. and then we did i think we might have even covered uh covered it once at a kid's show like part of it as a joke oh wow <clears throat> but you know is there a video of that anywhere why not i jesus i hope not <laughs> <laughs> uh you know i gotta tell you i'm i'm so fascinated by your by your story when i was researching for this um i mean just the the things that i was reading about uh all the way back from the beginning are just so Interesting. Um, so I want to go back to the beginning. I know that uh, when you were a kid, you wanted to be a, uh, a vet. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I know you played trumpet and, and your parents were singers in the church and stuff. But uh, w was it your parents that, that, you know, kind of pushed you in the musical direction? Oh, no, the opposite. No, no, no. Yeah, no, my parents sang in church. You know, I mean, we were super Christian Dutch reformed, you know, I mean, like, the Christian Church of England wasn't uh, strict enough. And so, you know, the Dutch and uh, a bunch of other people came to the States and reformed the Christian Church and made it stricter. I mean, it was like no secular music in the house. <clears throat> like the only secular music was like the Ray Conniff singers or something, you know what I mean? The Lawrence Welk versions of <clears throat> popular songs. So no, the exact opposite. They, if anything, they didn't, if I wasn't going to go into Christian music, then they wouldn't, they didn't want anything to do with music for me. So they may have pushed me towards the idea of being a vet when they caught me poking around with the dog and our cat, <laughs> you know, <laughs> putting a stethoscope. But most likely I was torturing the, the pets and they thought, well, maybe you could be a vet, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> but no, music was never on the table for me. <clears throat> no way. So when, when you were growing up, was it kind of like, uh, you know, rock and roll is like the, the devil's kind of stuff? Was that kind of what you grew up with? Oh, yeah, that? No, that was exactly what it was. There was the devil's music and there was God's music. And everybody knows the devil's music is a hundred times better. <laughs> you know? I, mean, I, agree. I didn't realize that until, you know, until my brother snuck a Kiss record in, in between a John Denver and Tony Orlando and Dawn album, I think, you know. He snuck that in and then we were all listening to Kiss Alive, you know, and I was like, my mind was blown. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Now we, I had a little AM radio I used to play, you know, used to go to sleep to all the top 40 hits, you know, when they allowed uh, the top 40 hits in, you know, when I was, I was probably six, seven, when you could start listening to secular stuff. Cause you can't get, you couldn't get away from it. I mean, I was going to public school. What, you know, it was like, how long can they keep you sheltered, you know? So. When you when you told them that, uh, you know, you were thinking about pursuing a career in music, I mean, what was their reaction to that? I never told them. I just did it. Oh, you, you know, just did brother, it? Yeah, my brother played guitar, my older brother, and then they got me, my parents did get me a guitar because they knew I was interested in it. And I think they were hoping that I would join them at the nursing homes when we would go to the nursing homes like the Van Trapp <laughs> family and sing ridiculous songs to the old people. You know, that's that's that was my concert debut. You know, so I think they'd hoped I'd play guitar for those sessions, but I ended up just learning on my own and uh, finger picking, you know, and then and then as I got older and got into like the James Taylors and the Cat Stevens and all that acoustic stuff for the finger picking, then I would, you know, pick up the needle on the record and put it back and listen for a couple seconds and figure out the finger picking patterns. And then 
from there, I just started writing songs, but I never told them anything until I got the gig at the Holiday Inn bars when I was 16. <laughs> then it was like, they're like, what? You're going to play at a bar at 16? I said, that's what I want to do. And I did. So I was, you know, I was a, just a little kid up there playing and singing for the old drunks. <laughs> do, do you have a good relationship with your, with your parents now? Yeah, they're dead. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm no, so sorry. That, that sounded terrible. I love my parents. <laughs> you know, I was just, I'm just joking for my family members who are listening to this. They're, they're so used to this anyway, this garbage I spew. Uh, <laughs> no, I love my parents. They're, they were the best. And my mom especially was an absolute saint uh, and very supportive of the Verve Pipe. She'd come to the show. She had a Verve Pipe jacket made just for special. It said Verve Pipe Mom on the back of it. So she was great. Um, but uh, I forget what your question was. Oh, do I have a good relationship with them now? That's funny. I'm going to regret saying that, I'm sure. <laughs> well, we'll put it into a soundbite and make sure everybody hears it. Unfortunately, yeah, please do. Please put that in the commercials <laughs> for the show. Now, unfortunately, my parents have both passed. But uh, and, and I tell you what, there, there's, there, there's probably a fortunate thing that nobody ever really likes to talk about that. And, th and that is there is a freedom when your parents are dead. When your parents are gone, there is a freedom to do anything you want artistically without getting judged. You know, when when the Verve Pipe albums came out in the 90s, my grandmother read the lyrics. You know, she would sit and read the lyrics and go, oh, my God, why is she reading the lyrics? What? I don't want my grandparents knowing about this stuff. And they would read every press article. You know, I remember talking about, you know, I'm, I'm very liberal and I come from a very, very conservative family and oh my god the sunday discussions were ridiculous you know i just stopped going over there you know so you know there's this kind of thing that happens when you you know i'm 56 years old now it's like oh they're gone and i'm when i'm writing something it's it's kind of nice to know i'm not going to get any any shit for it you don't have to worry about anyone monitoring the the lyrics, right? I mean, I have my aunts, you know, my aunts and uncles who are still around and they're, you know, but it's like, whatever. What about your kids? Do they, uh, do they, do they care yeah. when you write music or they're like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever? No, they, you know, you're exactly right. They don't, they don't really care. They, they don't, they, they kind of don't understand, you know, they think the magnitude of what I do and how it's, you know, it keeps the lights on in the house and, you know, and being a musician now is really tough. I mean, I can't imagine trying to break into the business now with the pandemic and everything. But, uh, you know, I mean, I do speaking gigs, I write books. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I try to do anything I can do as a musician to, you know, make a living. And but they don't they've never really liked the songs when they were little kids. They loved the kids albums. And like my son's in preschool now and their their school will play the kids albums because they like them because they're a lot of fun and energetic and stuff. And so he's very proud of that. But my older kids, you know, 15 and 10, they could care less. Yeah, that kind of seems to be a... I was going to say my 15 year olds into like music that I, I was never privy to as a kid. Like she's, I, I caught her the other day, I caught her the other day listening to the Velvet Underground. I'm like, oh my God, amazing fantastic you know and then my other daughter's like total top 40 100 percent. every time she gets in the car it's all the brand new stuff you like that kind of stuff or no i mean i listen to it and i appreciate you know that she likes it and i can see why she likes it but we discuss things like the auto tuning i can hear on every single fucking oh my song. god it's, it's fucking terrible and i go you can't hear that she, i don't know what you're talking about i'm like every <laughs> single when they do the run of notes you can hear you can hear the levels change you know each little like stairs that go up you know the t-pain thing i try to explain the t-pain thing that she doesn't understand so as much as i try to ruin it for her it's just not happening <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of T-Pain, did you see that video that came out like a, a few years ago where he was uh, actually singing? Um, no. And it's like, man, that guy can actually sing. sing right? No, I've yeah, heard that like, before. Why use the auto-tune if you can actually sing like that, you know? It's a sound. And also, you know, a lot of times we just get in our own way. You know, a lot of times as singers, you know, I feel like I can sing. And so here's a good, here's a good reason why on occasion I'll, I'll, have something tuned you know slightly it's because you sing something and you want to emote and you don't and and you don't want to have to worry about hitting the pitch exactly right you know what i mean so you can kind of let yourself go and then go you know what that's that's sharp 
and it's really sharp and it's bringing me it's bringing me out of the song and it's going to bring the listener out of the song so let's notch that down a little bit i mean that's an honest assessment of using a tuner and maybe that's maybe he's doing that times 100 to himself i don't know but you know there's so many people that use tuner now i would never do it live i mean that's that's insanity to me Oh, I, I agree. You know, I'm a, my, uh, I'm a huge uh, fan of Motley Crue. That's like my all time favorite band. And yeah. that might be the one band though, where they, uh, maybe they should use, uh, some, yeah. uh, some backing tracks. Cause you know, the band sounds all right, but my God, Vince Neil, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's pretty rough to, have you seen videos of him? I've seen videos of him. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's pretty rough to watch. Sometimes. I've seen the videos of, not to get, not to get back on the kiss thing too heavy, but, uh, but we did tour with Kiss, so I feel like I yeah, I know I did. I did want to get to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, you know, when you want to, but uh, but I was gonna say somebody uh, put all of the recorded like six different Kiss concerts and isolated uh, Paul's vocal and then put it on Pro Tools and showed that the waveforms were exactly the same on every single show, which makes it suspicious that he's you know either. Uh, singing to a recorded track well that's the only thing it could be singing to a recorded track you know which is uh which is weird man i don't know yeah you know i was we have a i'm i'm here in ohio and uh we have a, a festival down here that uh it's at the mansfield reformatory where they uh filmed that movie uh shawshank redemption yeah, oh, yeah. and we were down there a couple of years ago and uh this band i, I don't want to say who it is but uh the he's been like uh, accused of of singing the tracks before and you know oh it's not true it's not true and boy if i had a video of it it'd be a million dollar video because we were standing on the side side of the stage and he uh jumped out into the crowd and as he's coming back he had the mic in his pocket and uh you know the vocals you could still hear vocals you know and i'm like oh my god how do you make that mistake i know i know Uh, some people (laughs) just want to get caught i think (laughs) a <laughs> uh, free press right that's right um yeah so you know back to the the holiday and stuff i know uh, right after that you uh you went to the army and uh when, when you get back i think you said you you uh begged like for your job back or whatever so you didn't have to re-enlist or something yeah. um but then you uh you get discovered by by willie nelson and, and you're hanging out with him on the bus how does uh how, how did were you i'm assuming you were in michigan at the time yeah, it was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He did a show there, Miller Auditorium, and my buddy was a DJ, a country DJ, and, and asked me if I wanted to go meet him and go out and get on the bus and give him a demo tape that I had made, and and so I did. It was amazing. I mean, he he was uh, super gracious. Took my demo, <clears throat> said he would listen to it, and then he called me. He called me up three days later and said, Brian. I love this song of yours. Want to come up to Indianapolis and play Farm Aid Four? I was like, what? <laughs> First, I said, first thing I said was, fuck you, because I thought it was one of my friends, because I told all my friends that I had <laughs> Willie Nelson, and he laughed. I knew you were going to say that, you know, but... Uh, well, it's yeah, like yeah. that scene in the, the movie Rockstar that that uh, I think you were in and had the, the song in, you know, when the, the phone's ringing and, and it's the band calling, and oh, yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah, uh, whatever, it's not you, you know, fuck same you. Thing. Yeah. And that's why it's such a cliche, because it happens all the time. I'm sure nobody expects to pick up their home phone and have it be Willie Nelson, you know? it's just a it's a ridiculous uh but he you know he was he was great i mean i the thing that that did for me i thought it was going to do more for me because i thought well this is it i'm going to get a record deal it's going to be the whole thing and he didn't have a record you know he wasn't he wasn't madonna with maverick or something he didn't have any kind of record label i didn't play country music you know it would have been such a stretch for me to be uh, have anything to do with willie after that but what he gave me was a real shot in the arm. It was like, you know, the, just the encouragement that somebody who is as iconic as Willie Nelson, this tremendous songwriter, is listening to my song and telling me how great it is. And then I've met people over the years that said, you know, Willie played me your song when I was on the bus, like during. No the- shit! Wow. He was, and he told them, 
I wish I would, I, I really should write something like this about my song. And I was a kid and it's a terrible song. It's what song was it? Is it, is it out there? It's called, no, it's called This Promised Land. I haven't even found a demo of it. It's, it's all, it's all about the American farmer and it's, it's got rainbow. It talks about the promise of the rainbow and it's got a unicorn. It's no, it doesn't have a unicorn, but it's, it's just, <laughs> it sounds like a, how a teenager would write lyrics. You know what I mean? It's just, it's not there. It's like, but how old were you when this when this thing with Willie Nelson happened? Uh, I, well, ninety, so I was twenty, uh, twenty six. Yeah, I was twenty six, so I was already, at, you know, getting past the point of rock stardom at that point. And this was before the the Verve pipe even was a thing, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I I formed a band at, right after that to play uh, that song and play some other songs, and then. Uh, and we did that for a couple of years. That band was called Johnny with an eye. And then there was another band around Michigan called water for the pool. And we all, uh, we played with each other one time and we just said, we should put the best of the, these two bands together. Cause they had a huge following. We had a pretty big following. And then we formed the Verve pipe. Yeah. That was in 1992. So a couple of years later. Well, I know when you guys formed and, and you put out, uh, I think it was what two albums independently and sold like 50,000 copies of, of yeah. you know, both combined, which is just insane because uh, I mean, obviously record sales aren't really a thing anymore, but you know, there's bands now that, that you know, successful bands that don't even sell 10,000 copies. Right. Right. You know, I, well, listen, I mean, back then we played all the time. Uh, we sold, you know, we sold CDs out of our van, essentially. And, and it really was like, if we're going to make it, we're going to have to prove that we can sell CDs because we weren't in Seattle. We weren't in LA or Nashville or anything. Uh, and so we did. And I think, I think our, I think all the record labels that came out, there's seven record labels that came out and passed on us, including RCA until they signed us. But the, you know, they would get reports from the, uh, from the manufacturers of what bands were, you know, what bands were local bands or whatever, small bands were selling a lot of records and ordering records from these uh, manufacturing companies and our name kept coming up. And so that's when they sent out, it was a smart way to do business for, you know, for guys that were recruiting new bands, you know, to look and see who's selling them on their own. And there we were, you know, and we charted in Michigan at the radio stations, you know, we charted right up there with Pearl Jam and everybody else, even before we had signed. So we already had a good thing going and still everybody passed, you know, it was still a really hard job to make it work. So what was it that made, you said RCA originally passed, what was it that made them say, all right, you know, let's, let's revisit this and then offer you the, the four album deal? Well, we did a we did a show at the State Theater in Kalamazoo. It was for our album called Pop Smear, which was our second album, and it was huge. We sold it out, you know. So that was a you know fifteen hundred seat venue, I think. We sold that out, and then we we did like I think we did like ten grand in merch, something ridiculous, you know. We sold so much merchandise and stuff, and then uh, you know we had signed a Yamaha. We won the Yamaha Sound Check, which was a you know, a competition. It was a worldwide competition. And that's where we met our manager. And I think, you know, the manager signed on just before that release party. So I think all those things came together. And RCA was the first one that came out and uh, again for a second time. And then I was taking calls from Jason Flom, you know, of Atlantic, who was like, don't sign with RCA. That's a huge mistake, you know. And so there was a bit of a bidding war and the whole thing. So it took a, it, Honestly, the band had only been together for about a year when all this started happening. So it wasn't that much work, but I was already 28, 29. I think I was 31 when we got signed, 30, 31 when I got signed. Yeah. So I was late. And you were, uh, you were living like in a, in a storage unit when all this was, was going on. Yeah, Is that right? My girlfriend kicked me out and, uh, we had, the band had a storage unit and, uh, you know, bands back then, I don't know if bands still do this, but it's brilliant. You pay a hundred dollars, you get a storage unit and you find a storage unit that's powered and you plug in and you rehearse That's your rehearsal hall. I mean, it's, it's great. I just lived in there. I just, there was a mattress on the floor. It was disgusting, <laughs> but I lived on there. I lived in there even when we got signed. That's when I moved in there. And then, uh, and I wrote a lot of those villain songs in that storage unit. You know, some of them were already written. Like the freshman was old at that point. I think Photograph was old. Yeah, Photograph and Freshman and Cattle and a couple of other songs were on a demo that we gave to RCA when they came the second time. And he loved he loved Photograph in particular and Freshman. Well, the 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 story about the the song The Freshman is is such a, a crazy story because 
Uh, I mean, obviously you had it before villains and uh, I think you said it took you what, like a year to come up with, with just the, the concept of the, of the song, right? You had the melody yeah. um, that I think you said it like came to you in the shower or something. Yeah. And then another uh, cliche, it's another cliche. These are all cliches. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. It's like, and, and I saw really quick. I don't want to go. I have a tendency to talk too much. Just show no, that's all right. Show. Talk as much but as you I, want. I remember watching Paul McCartney on uh, some of the, one of the late night shows. And I think it was yesterday. And he said, I had this melody in my head and it came to me in the shower. And then I was going around talking to all my friends saying, Hey, do you know this song? Do you know this song? And, and after a few days, I thought it was mine. It was the same thing with me. I asked my friends, I said, what is this? Is this a jingle or something? You know, da 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 It sounded like the, it sounded like a jingle to me. And uh, nobody knew what it was. I'm like, okay, that's mine. And then I worked on the song. And at the end of a year of working on the song, I didn't even have the freshman yet. I didn't have that line, da da we were merely freshmen, but I had the melody. And I, that was the hardest thing. I knew that that was the hook and I had to figure out what that was. So I'm walking around the house, you know, got to make some breakfast. <laughs> <Gotta get my laughs> day job, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, yeah, I was sitting there before work one morning and the MTV was on at the corner uh, with the sound off and I was noodling on the guitar. You know, I worked at a sporting goods store. I was going to be late for work. And, uh, and all of a sudden I looked down on the coffee table and there is a, the VHS copy of the movie I had rented the night before, which was the freshman with Marlon Brando and, and Matthew Broderick. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's it. These guys are freshmen. They did all these things. They'll be, you know, they'll be forgiven by society for, because, you know, they were kids or whatever. And then later they pay for it, you know, through their guilty feelings. And it was, it was perfect. And then at the same time, on MTV at the same time, the Divinals video for I Touch Myself was on where she was laying back, touching her face. And that was the other line I needed. And it rhymed and it, it didn't make any sense with the story really. But people to this day still love that line and go, what does that mean? Was it? I don't really want to tell them the truth. It's going to ruin it. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how things uh, like that just, just come together, just seemingly out of nowhere. It's, it's insane. The universe, man. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a religious guy, you know, after years of that. Uh, but I just, there's something, there's just something out there. We're conduits, you know, that's another cliche, but it's true. Like it, this shit, sometimes it just lands in the lap of the right person at the right time. Freshman landed right in my lap, you know? So, well, I mean, I did work at it for a year. I could have, right. I could have fucked it up. That's for sure. Well, the, the, uh, the tour with kiss that we were talking about earlier, that was on the, uh, villains album right that was that was yeah. uh, that was and, right before villains came out and then we did the tour in europe with them when villains was out you know who who thought that it would be a, a good idea to have the verve pipe out with kiss gene simmons oh and he paul, liked you guys and paul stanley apparently I, I pissed off paul because i said in the press that it was just gene and paul was very <laughs> instrumental too apparently okay paul take it easy um that, yeah, the ego on that guy <laughs> no, like they don't deserve their egos uh no yeah so they were the ones that said this will be great you got to come out they heard an advanced copy of the record so they asked us to come out and then we played these shows with them and it was awful it was just the worst you know that was the that was the crowd that i would never fear another crowd for the rest of my life they were just terrible to us yeah, uh, do you think it was, uh, I mean, even though it was, it was a, a rough thing, do you think it was still like a, uh, like a meaningful and, and worthwhile experience in the sense that, you know, it probably gave you guys a little bit thicker skin, you know, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. just the experience overall of going out with a band like Kiss, I mean, is insane. Yeah, well, I mean, you're talking about guys that are cramming, you know, you cram five guys into a hotel room and you're, you know, you're, you get a flat tire in your van, you got to unload all the equipment, change the tire and all this stuff. And then you're going to go on tour with Kiss and you're going to eat catered food and be on a tour bus and, you know, use their masseuse if they let you, you know, I mean, this is, you know, there's a huge difference before the band's even famous, you know, before the freshman comes out, you know, so yeah, uh, but the thick skin thing, you know, I didn't realize that was going to be part of it until I stepped foot on that stage for the first time. And, and the rain of booze, because listen, 20,000 people bought tickets and 20,000 people waited for two hours in the arena crammed in there to see Kiss after so many years of them not having the original members back together and the lights go down and 20,000 Kiss fans roar in anticipation of finally seeing Kiss and the lights come up and it's some stupid band. <laughs> you don't know who it is. What are you going to do? You know what I mean? I do the same thing. I don't want 
want to see some other band for a half hour, but we got through it. You know, I mean, Gene came in afterwards. He came in almost every night. He was such a great, great mentor. He came in and he just said, yeah, this is, this is what it is. You know, this, this don't take it, don't take it personally. This happens to everybody. And I was like, well, thanks for telling us after, you know, we just signed on for 30 days or whatever. Are you still in touch with any of the Kiss guys? Oh yeah. I called Gene. I want to say I called him six years ago. I said, Hey Gene, it's Brian from the Verve Pipe. Click. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. I mean, it was like, all right, dude. I, mean, wow. I had written a script and stuff and I wanted to take a look at it. And he was like, he doesn't have any, look, he's in, he's in for the buck. He doesn't. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course. Brian Vander up in the verb. <laughs> he probably heard Brian and hung up. <laughs> he didn't even get, you know. Well, you know, I feel like, I, I feel like Kiss, you know, opening for Kiss is, is probably a similar thing as of like opening for, you know, Iron Maiden or something where, you know, you're there because you want to see, you want to see Maiden, you want to see Kiss. I don't give a fuck who the opener is. You know what I mean? So, uh, probably, you know, everybody I think that that gets a slot like that. While it's while it's an amazing thing to be opening for a band like that, I mean, I'm sure yeah. it's a very common thing. I mean, now in you know in hindsight, you go, yes, of course. Back then, you go, oh, we're gonna change their attitudes tonight. We're gonna rock them. He never changed their attitude. In fact, the last show of the tour was in. Uh, Germany and the Germans were the worst and I spoke German I lived in Germany when I was in the army I spoke German to them and everything and they still hated us threw stuff at us and my brother Brad would go out front and with his black because my brother Brad didn't give a fuck he just he, he'd get right out there and they'd spit on him he'd come back be covered black shirt covered in loogies <laughs> after the show it was awful oh no it was disgusting oh my god wow. it was disgusting it was like he had a glitter shirt on uh, and he, uh, but that last night I took off my shirt and I put a towel around, I, I had cut out some fake styrofoam teeth and I put them in and I sang, uh, I did a Freddie Mercury impression and sang, we are the champions, the 20,000 booing Germans. And I, I found video of that and put it up on, uh, I, it's on my, it's on the Brian Vander Ark channel at YouTube. You can find it there. Um, and it's, it's pretty funny because there's, there's such joy in my face at one point. I'm just laughing and loving it that we're done with the tour. And I did this ridiculous thing that I know years later is going to crack me up. And it still cracks me up when I watch it, you know. Well, that's just, uh, that's, that's, uh, I mean, you guys have had just such a, an insane story. And after, after the, the Villains album cycle, you go to do the, the, the second one. And I, I, you went to New York and it was supposed to be a, a three month thing that turned into nine months. I think you said because of, yeah. of egos were getting out of control. Egos were out of control. We, we wanted to take in the vibe of New York. Musicians love to say those kinds of things. We're taking the vibe of the city, man. And we'll do, <laughs> you know, you know, we'll set up one microphone just for the vibe. You know, it's just like, what does that even mean? Another cliche, and, right? <laughs> yeah, another cliche. And then it takes nine months. By the way, all these cliches, they're warning signs. You know what I mean? We, I spent all my money. I, you know, I'm a behind the music. I knew all those cliches. I followed every one of them to a T. We spent way too much money on our follow-up record. And then we sold like 7,000 copies or something. And, and we owed $1.2 million for that record. It was, it was a huge mistake, you know? Well, do you think that that only 7,000 copies of Underneath sold? Because I know it came out like, I think it was like a week after 9-11 had hit. Um, we're, well, right we're talking about the Frog album now. The, that was the New York album. There, there was an album after that. I'm a, totally, wow. So no, no, no. Yeah, that's. that's mixed up there. Yeah, if you had this, if you had the story, maybe it was an edited version of the story because <laughs> my story is pretty long. Uh, but we had that album that called the Fro they called it the Frog album. It had a dissected frog on the cover. Uh, that was Michael Beinhorn production. Uh, and then we worked with Adam Schlesinger of Fountains of Wayne for underneath. And we all left our egos at the door and we, you know, yeah, we you said he kind of helped you guys kind of get back together and, and kind of yeah. find your way again. Yeah, he was terrific. I mean, unfortunately, I don't know if anybody, if you don't know this, he passed. He, he yeah, I did see that. that. April 1st, last year, he died of COVID. A great guy, but he brought us together. And this album was going to be huge because we had a song in the movie Rockstar. Uh, we had a single already on radio. It was like number 22 with a bullet. Uh, you know, all when this album was going to come out. And then, yeah, it came out the week of 9-11. Now, Listen, that's no excuse. There were other albums that were great that came out at the same time that did perfectly well. 
Uh, but well, that's what I was going to ask you is, you know, if, if uh, 9-11 didn't happen, you know, do you think the record would have done much better? I think it would have done much better only because we would have been able to promote it. You know, you couldn't go on a radio station and say, hey, buy our album. You know, you just couldn't do it. I, I mean, I, you could do it. I wouldn't do it. It just felt wrong. And so I went to the radio, I had a whole radio station tour that the, uh, the record label had set up and everything. And I refused to like promote the album. I just talked about 9-11, I talked about the Red Cross and I, you know, I, I sang, I remember singing the national anthem, you know, every time I went on instead of singing a song from the record, all of these things where it just, it just would have felt gross to promote the album. So listen, it's, mo it's probably in my lap. It's my fault that I didn't, try to take advantage of it more but how could you do that i don't know anybody that could have done that and again there were other albums that that people didn't promote that sold phenomenally during that so that 9 11 is not an excuse you know well and then the the movie rock star that the the song colorful was in and i i believe you were in the movie too you had like a small role in the in the film as well right I yeah i was one of the one of the uh, out of focus guys <laughs> now i had a couple I had a couple lines. I did get one of my own lines in there that I, I the line with Stephen Jenkins uh, in the parking lot where I said, I thought I smelled pussy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love that movie. I haven't seen it in, in so long. That was an ad lib. I mean, you know, I like Steven. Steven's, you know, Steven's got a bit of an ego like I do, you know, back then, especially, you know, and he's, he's kind of aloof, you know, he's just, you know, but I like guys that are kind of strong, you know what I mean? I don't like the guys that are like, I love everybody. Oh, they're the great, you know, I hate guys like that. No, yeah, no, likewise. Steven's just, yeah, Steven's just a guy that's like, a, you know, he's just like a real dude, you know, he's got a, you know, he's got a hot girlfriend at that point. Charlize was his girlfriend at that point. And, and I just felt like he had to take, be taken down a notch. <laughs> so I said it as a joke, and, and they we kept all it laughed. In. And then they set it up, and they said, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna put that in the script." I was like, "Oh, all right, awesome. I got I just got myself another line now." Whether Stephen knew it was in the script, if he'd read the script or not, I don't know. But I haven't I haven't talked to him since. <laughs> well, I, I know at the time, I, I think that movie was like a, a tanker as well because that came out. Uh, I think like a week before nine eleven had hit or whatever. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, horrible just, timing for everything just like what do you do i mean listen we had an opportunity with that second album with the frog album and we just blew it i just blew it so you know that's that's i'm paying my penance you know when you say you blew it i mean what do you what do you mean by you I know mean, i spent too much time on the we spent too much time you know dicking around in new york and spending money and and you know we do one guitar part for every 10 days or something it was just like it's it's our fault we didn't have the songs i should have kept writing and writing and writing and writing hit songs you know i mean i that's you know i just i just didn't have it in me i didn't have the songs in me you know or i met you know here's another thing about the muse and about the universe if i can get all shirley mclean again is that you know when you're when these songs are bo uh, bestowed upon you like i said i still worked on the freshman for a year but a lot of times these songs will be gifts and you'll you'll get in your own way it's like, you know, what if I wrote, what if that freshman moment didn't happen with the VHS tape? You know, what if I overwrote it or overthought it? And then, you know, and I screwed up the freshman, you know, which we almost did. We recorded it once with Jerry Harrison and it was six minutes long. And that was the first version that was on Villains. And then we went back in and re-recorded it the, the way we should have recorded it. So I could have messed up those songs that were given to me for the frog album by taking nine months to actually record them and, and, you know, partying every night and everything. Cause we were worldwide rock stars. I mean, we, that was our celebration album, you know, and it was just terrible. I mean, it's a great album. I love the album, but you know, it's just, it could have been, it wasn't radio friendly at all. Well, and after the underneath album came out, that was when, uh, I believe you got you and RCA had had parted ways then, correct? Yeah, they called me. Our guy, our you know, our guy called me. You know, just a couple weeks after nine eleven, or maybe three or four weeks after nine eleven, and we, you know, before nine eleven, we were strapped in for superstardom. We were ready, to, you know, because this album was going to be huge. And and then I got the call a month later from him that they were going to drop us, and then they dropped us. That was it. That was the end. You know, you've, uh, I, I saw you say somewhere that, uh, that you think if, if you had a better relationship with RCA, that 
you could have had a, a more successful uh, career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, back then, it wasn't cool to like your label. You know, I thought that was what the thing is. It's like, it was cool. And I write about that in my, my book, which hopefully will be coming out here in the next six months. It wasn't cool back then to like license your songs, right? We had Kodak come to us and offer, I don't know, a gajillion dollars to use our song photograph. And we're like, we're not selling out, <laughs> you know? And then a month later, like Moby, like licenses his whole album for commercial use, you know, and the Verve licenses, you know, Bittersweet Symphony to Nike. And you just go, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, these are the kind of mistakes that I made along the way. So, yeah, I think if I would have worked with RCA more and gone to more of the meetings and, you know, and hung out with them more and and listened to the a &R people that have been there for years that, you know, know how to make things work and massage the radio people a little more instead of, you know, flipping them off, then then I would have been in a, I'd be in a much better position now. But you know what? My kids wouldn't be born. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you kind of weigh those kinds of things and go, well, there's a reason why all this happened, you know, get a great sure. life. Oh, yeah, you know, it's funny you bring the Kodak thing up. I I, uh, I believe it was Kodak way back in the day. My great grandparents had like an opportunity to invest into Kodak, oh. and they were like, "No way! <laughs> like this ain't gonna go anywhere." That's like that great. Uh, that's like that great scene in Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks, where he invested. His buddy goes, "You got to invest in Casio." I'm telling you, you know. And this is like 1970s, like japan he goes i'm not gonna invest in the japanese watchmaker who would ever invest in that you know and it's like oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it's uh it's it's uh, it's just uh, insane but um you know you brought up your book uh earlier um what is it a uh, is it a biography i'm assuming or yeah it's an autobiography it's it's you know but it's <clears throat> there's you know there it's a how do i explain it it's a little offbeat like I am, you know, I have conversations with Jesus along my head, an imaginary friend, Jesus, when I was a kid, you know, my Sunday school teacher said, listen, imagine one of your favorite people as Jesus, and you can talk to him about anything. And so Willy Wonka was my Jesus, and I would talk to him all the time. And then I kind of grew up with him all along the way, like everyone's like Gene Wilder would show up. You know, and Jesus took different forms. He was Kurt Cobain for a little while. So these uh, icons come with me along the ride of this biography. So it's all pretty funny and pretty loose and uh, these conversations about things. And uh, I'm super excited about it. I think it's, I mean, it's, I'm really, really happy with the way it came out. Now the publisher's looking at it, hoping to get, I'm hoping to get a big check. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully it'll come out soon because I mean, with this pandemic, you know, everybody's uh kind of staying inside and, and probably reading more than they've ever read before and all yeah, sorts of stuff. My timing's going to be, my time is always terrible if you haven't picked up <laughs> yeah. from this interview. So this, I've been working on this thing for six years now. So it's like, well, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, well, yeah, it's too bad you couldn't uh, release it like a, a year ago, uh, you know, when the whole yeah. thing started, because it's like, man, you would have sold a shit ton of copies. Damn, if only the pandemic would have happened now. You're right. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, after you uh, after you get dropped by RCA, I know you uh, you said you had bought like a, an RV and just kind of yeah. started traveling around. And this was all by yourself, right? It was just Brian Vanderark, no Verve pipe. It was just you going around I, playing shows and stuff, right? Yeah, I had a harmonica player that came with me for a little while, Griff. But for the most part, no, I traveled around in that RV and sold everything and just went out and was just going to drive off into the sunset and play coffee houses and that kind of thing for the rest of my life. But I realized when I was out there that, again, I was secluded in this giant metal box like the storage unit. And and uh, I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And then I went and recorded an album for five thousand hours and uh, and I sold like ten thousand copies. And, you know, when you don't have a record label taking 90 percent of the profit, then ten thousand copies is one hundred thousand dollars. So I was making money again. I mean, that's yeah. like that was the key. I realized and then I got married and then we bought a house in 2008 during the housing crisis and like things all went to shit. Another bad, uh, another example of, of horrible timing. Right? I'm, the worst. I'm the worst. Uh, I'm the absolute worst. I cannot get out of my own way. So. And it was, it was around this time that you started doing the, uh, uh, the, the lawn chairs and, and living room tours, right? Where you would go. Yeah, to that was out of necessity. Yeah. And, and that just came from, happened. That whole thing, the whole concept started from from an email that, that a fan had sent you, right, about playing their birthday party or something. And she was like, hey, you play my birthday party? I'm like, God, rock star, I don't play birthday parties. You know? 
And then she wrote me back. She's like, I'll give you $2,500. I'm like, what time is that party? So I like drove to her house and played her party. And I'm, I'm driving home that night. And the party was great. I mean, 50 folding chairs in her living room for her family and friends. And then, it, and then people started yelling out requests like it was the Holiday Inn bars again. It was like <laughs> everything came together that night. It was full like, circle, yeah. Is, yeah, it's totally full circle in my music uh, career. And, and I loved it. And I, I loved that show. And I was driving home with a check for $2,500 in one pocket and like $500 in merchandise sales. And I was like, I have 4,000 people on my solo artist mailing list. They all have birthdays. That's $10 million. I was like, <laughs> and so, but I just sent an email out and I said, look, it's hard, man. It's hard to make a living. Just book me into your home. And then I sent the email out and I booked 52 shows like 24 hours later. And it was crazy. And then the next year, I realized I didn't have to travel with a PA. I just had the guitar. So I booked 100 shows and I did like two or three a day on the weekends, sometimes four a day on the weekends, you know, and booked, you know, in the, just the summer months, 110 house guys. So I, I retired it a few years ago at, after I hit, I think, the 800, 800th house concert mark. Oh, wow. So that was my million dollar idea. I mean, that. I made more money and did better at that than I did when the Verve pipe was on top. I mean, that really just, that was the moment for me, you know. That was did you ever moment. feel like when you, when you were doing, I'm, I'm sure it was cool to kind of, you know, be with fans like face to face and, and have that, that connection. Cause you do seem to be a very fan driven guy, especially now with the Patreon and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. You know, was it ever like a little, I, I don't know, embarrassing maybe or something like, man, I, you know, it was, a rock star I've toured with kiss. I was in a yep. fucking movie and we had, you know, these hit songs and stuff. And now I'm playing in whoever the fuck's fucking living room, you know? Yeah. Well, listen, that's one of the things my manager said in the beginning, you know, yeah, he said, I hear grumblings and rumblings from people about, you know, oh, he's doing that now. What? And I'm like, yeah, I know it kind of sucks. You know, it sucks that we're not on the big tours and we're not, you know, we don't have the tour bus and the, you know, I'm driving myself in a rental car to play these shows, but I needed to do that. I knew I needed to, to kill my ego and just go do this and go knock on a door where I didn't know the person behind it had only gone back and forth on email. And I don't know what to expect, but there was something really exciting about that. And you know what, honestly, out of 800, I can say maybe 10 were bad enough where I would have said, I, I can't go back there again, you know, from bad in, in like, in, in what ways? Like what, what well, happened? I mean, sometimes people, the worst ones were always where your background music, they don't understand what the concept is. You know, when you have a house concert and you know, you're, you're a guy like me who likes to tell stories and play songs, play a, co play a cover song or whatever. And I'll tell a story about how, why the song meant, you know, that kind of thing. You have a conversation or you really funny stories. This is what the show is. You know what I mean? It's an engaging type of show. And when you get there and it's a full on party where your background music, where it's like playing one song into the next, then I go, well, I played that one and I, I'll never go back there again because they didn't understand what the concept was, um, that kind of thing. So maybe there was still a little bit of ego there. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I did, uh, I, I did read that, or I heard you say that uh, there was one point when you're, I think you said it was like at the height of your ego where uh, you uh, wouldn't get on, you almost missed a show because you had had a flight, but it was like misbooked yeah. or something and you were on a middle seat in economy. Oh, oh yeah, I was good. I was full on canceling the show. I was in the airport <laughs> canceling the show <clears throat> because they, I think they, what happened was my manager told me it later they change planes. And back then when you change planes, they kind of put you in a seat wherever they can fit you. You know what I mean? When yeah. the planes change, suddenly there's not an aisle or window and I'm stuck. I think they realized years later how horrible it is for people. But I'm suddenly, I think I'm booked in a middle seat and I'm not getting on that plane, that show in Portland, you're going to cancel that show because I am not getting on that plane. And they even called, they even called, you know, we're ready to board There's you know, Rose, whatever. And I saw all the guys in my band get up, get to board. And I'm like, those fuckers, they're, they're not standing with me here. We're not going to this show. I'm not riding in the middle seat for four hours. This is insanity. And then I get on the, and then, and, and no shit, this is real too. I get on there and the lady sitting on the aisle has an oxygen tank. She's an old lady and the sweetest old lady. And it's just like an overweight businessman on my left and the old lady with the oxygen tank. And, my, and I'm, and the guys are getting on my guys in the band are getting on the plane and just looking at me, laughing their asses off. It's just the funniest thing to them, but they didn't realize how close they were to playing without me that night. 
Wow. Yeah, that's how big the ego is, man. You just knock you two off the number one spot. You're like, I'm not sitting in a middle seat, coach. <laughs> You're insane. You know. That's uh, it. <laughs> uh, you know, we uh, you brought up. I think it was at the very beginning. You brought up the the kids albums. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I'm curious, uh, you know, especially I, I guess uh, with with the ego that that you you know mentioned. You know, where does that come from? And and I, I would think that, uh, you know, an ego would like, oh, I'm not making a fucking kids album. I mean, come on. You yeah, know what I mean? guys in the band that said that, you know. But, you know, for me, you know, after Underneath, the record that we all really loved that didn't do anything, we kind of quit going in the studio. And we weren't all getting along then, you know. And, uh, and it was a way to go back into the studio and have fun. You know, they were really fun, funny songs. They were, you know, queen like guitar solos and all this great fun stuff that we hadn't heard. Cause the only kids music that we knew of really was the wiggles and, you know, anybody, you know, at that time, I think bare naked ladies had a kid's record out. That was pretty good. Like we didn't know Dan Zanes or any of these other alternative artists that were doing it. And we just wanted to make a fun, heavy rock, four-part harmony album with great songs and harmonies and the whole thing and uh and so we did it got back in the studio and we had a lot of laughs the songs cracked us up and uh, they were all about shenanigans of growing up and stuff when we were growing up and so we loved it it got us back into the studio and then it was so successful Sirius XM played the hell out of it we played Lollapalooza and, and Austin City Limits but the kid stages and uh, refused to play the freshman too, which yeah, we just shot ourselves in the foot too, because we had like 10,000 people show up in Austin city and they wanted to hear the freshman. And we're like, and they wouldn't let the kids go up front. We're like, this is a kid's show. We're not playing the freshman. Fuck off, go to a different stage. You know? uh, but that's, but you know, honestly, man, I mean, it's just music. What I've learned from playing the house concerts and meeting these people is like, it's just music, relax. Well, let's just have some fun. I mean, we had a lot of people roll our eyes that we're a kid's band now too, but it, what, I don't care what people think. I mean, we've made three rock records since then and, uh, and I'm loving every second of it. You know? Yeah, well, I was going to say the the band uh, kind of kind of seems to be in a in a better place, uh, you know, these days. I mean, obviously not with not yet, not COVID yet. and all that, but you know, and it, it was uh, interesting because uh, it was in another interview you said about uh, you you weren't uh, you didn't want to do any like drive-in shows or anything like that. Um, yeah, I wasn't into that. But I know I you guys did a you did a live stream recently. Uh, was there, is that something you would consider doing again? Or was that Absolutely. kind of just like a... It's got to be under our terms, though. I mean, when, you know, I mean, the way I look at it now, and maybe this still has a little bit of ego do, uh, to it, but I want to do things on our terms. You know, I, I don't want to go, I'm 56, I'm kind of crabby. I don't want to go do shows I don't want to do. I don't want to go on the 90s tour and play for 20 minutes with every other 90s band. And this was back before COVID, you know, I, that just isn't my thing. I want to put on our own show and enjoy our own show in a, you know, in a smaller club or whatever, but have control of the show and be able to play two hours or three hours if we want to, yeah. that kind of thing. I don't like any of the, you know, any restraints. Um, so yeah, doing the streaming thing, it's like everybody's doing the Facebook streaming thing or whatever. And I said, let's rent out a club and we're going to get a four camera shoot and we're going to stream it. And we're going to pretend like the audience isn't there. Like we do when we rehearse. And if we mess up a song and we mess it up and we laugh and we're going to poke fun at each other and pretend like the cameras aren't there and people are going to get a real glimpse of who we are and what we are like. And we, I'm honestly, the guys in my band are the funniest guys and they're just brilliant and they're all great musicians and that streaming concert is one of my favorite moments i mean that that was a lot of fun so you know and we'll continue to do that the whole drive-in thing i just wasn't into that whole idea of that i don't know you know i went to i went to one drive-in show uh back in the fall and uh, it was like an acoustic show and uh it was it was very weird i don't think the venue was prepared for it um because you know uh you just uh, we couldn't hear um yeah you couldn't hear it. it was uh Aaron Lewis from from Stained and mm -hmm. Sully Erner from Godsmack and and uh you know it was a cool music? that'd be great that yeah be I mean great. I love Aaron Lewis is such a good singer and, and yeah and you know it was it was a cool thing to to see but uh yeah I mean they just weren't prepared and and the vibe just overall was just kind of weird and and uh you know yeah I'm not a big fan of the driving thing because it's just kind of awkward and and uh 
somebody else was on the show a while back and they were like, you know, we don't want to do them because uh, we don't want that to become the the new normal. You know what I mean? And, and right. By doing it, you're, you know, you're kind of condoning what the new normal might be. I understand that. I don't think I didn't want to do it because of either of those reasons. I just didn't like the idea of the way it looked and everything. There's like no control, open air. I knew about the speaker systems, you know, and the whole thing. And are they going to use, sometimes they use the drive-in speakers and sometimes they have a spot, you know, you tune into your radio and that kind of thing. And there's just no control over it that I can have, you know, to make sure that it's amazing for the fans. You know, it just felt like it was all too willy nilly put together. <clears throat> and so I thought, I'm just going to wait this out and see what happens. And, uh, and I didn't plan on waiting a year, but <laughs> you know, we waited a year, you know? Um, yeah, well, I'm just, uh, you know, it kind of feels like, uh, you know, I, I don't know that not, not that this thing's almost over, but it feels like, uh, you know, we're kind of finally maybe moving in the right direction a little bit. And <clears throat> I agree. I feel that. I feel that same thing. There's a definite, there's a definite shift going on. And I'll tell you what, I'll probably always wear a mask every time I go to the grocery store from now on. I'm so used to it and I kind of like it. <laughs> Although people can't recognize me and I have to sing the freshman to myself. Yeah, you got to feed that ego, right? <laughs> I kind of want to the freshman under my mask so people know it's me. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, no, but I feel the same thing. Like we, we've kicked our, con our tour down the road. Our tour is supposed to happen last March when this whole thing happened. And now it got kicked all the way, you know, then it was August and then it was this, you know, then it was this March and now it's May. So, <clears throat> but I feel like May is going to happen. So, you know, it feels, it feels good right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I work in the music industry is my full-time job. I'm an agent and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just been, uh, it's been a little tough, but uh, you know, it does feel like it uh, feels like things are getting better. So yeah. hopefully, cause you know, I, I mean, finally been able to kind of get back to work the last you know month month and a half or whatever after almost a year you know yeah man i know it's exciting right it's exciting i'm not getting my hopes too high though you know the great thing about this for musicians though i think in bands that took advantage of this downtime was that there's going to be a lot of uh, st stuff that was created during this period and you're going to see a wave of create new material from all the bands and then all the bands are going to want to tour and and prices will be lower. I think the massive ticket price problem that we have is going to come down again. I think, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe people are going to be off or willing to pay more and ticket master. Well, I, you know, I think that, you know, from a fan side, I think there will be uh, like a, a renewed appreciation, uh, you know, for, for live music. I, I think that the second the floodgates open and, and shows are back, I mean, it's going to be a fucking madhouse. Everybody's going to be going to shows as often as they can. <clears throat> Guaranteed, and it's going to be it's going to be better than ever. I think. You know, I think yeah, I think right now we're the shows are for us are going to be at half capacity per the law, but I I even think that's going to get better. So I don't know. It's going to get back to the you know the '90s where we were passing people overhead and making out with random people in the front row. And <laughs> <kind of thing. laughs> I, <don't, clears throat> I think we're a ways from that yet. <clears throat> hopefully not too long <laughs> you feeling all right there you uh yeah, like well, you're... you know man i i hardly even talk and i had a speaking gig yesterday and i was like i was dying i was like i hardly even talk anymore <laughs> i mean talk to my kids but that's mostly just yelling <laughs> <laughs> i have a two and a half year old I, I i know how it goes oh man is that all you have one kid yeah <clears throat> just one just one boy a girl he's a, it's a boy uh he that's uh an age man Oh, it is fun. And I was going to say about your, your kids albums. It's uh, I, I only heard like a, a snippet of one, one song, but it's gotta be so much better than, than the shit that I'm for, forced to listen play to. Him, today. Uh, play them cereal. Look up cereal, the verb pipe cereal. I recommend everybody look that up. It's ridiculous. It's about my love of cereal, <clears throat> but it's I will, got a lot of harmonies and chord changes. And it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, the funny thing about that really quick, I'll say this really quick. I know we're trying to wrap it up, but the funny thing about that is it's so more freeing to do kids music because you don't have to worry about the norms. You can change the key. You can, you know, you can add an oboe if you want to add an oboe and it won't sound pretentious because it's a kid's album. And that kid that plays the oboe and band's going to go, Oh my God, they have an oboe solo. I'm fine. With you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So well, I'll have to play him. I'll have to play him cereal because he, he loves cereal himself. So, and oh. plus I'm tired of hearing fucking baby shark. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, two other things before we uh, wrap it up. One, I wanted to uh, give you a chance to uh, explain your your uh, Patreon for anyone that, that, that's uh, listening that's a fan of yours. 
when you said uh, explain, I thought you were going to tell me something I said in the press once. I have to explain oh, okay. myself. Uh, no, no. Oh, shit, what's no. going on now? <laughs> uh, no, the Patreon page is great. Patreon.com has saved me in this uh, crisis, you know, and saves a lot of artists. You know, basically pay, go to patreon.com slash Brian Vanderark and you'll find demos. I do a Patreon concert once a month. I do all request concerts, that kind of thing. I'm very active there. Every couple of days, I'll post something. I just posted something this morning. I posted excerpts from my book and that kind of thing. And then all the old demos I post there and that kind of thing. So it's just a great way to connect. And also, if, when you do that, and a lot of artists do this as well, you have a direct contact to me. If you want anything, I'll give a guitar lesson, you know, recording of a guitar lesson. I'll listen to demos and give my opinion, that kind of thing. So... Uh, it's really, it's been amazing. I didn't know how it was going to go over, but so far it's been phenomenal. I love it. I love the connection I've made with my fans that way. So, and it's as low as $3 a month, you know, just to see all the content and be a participant, you know. That's a very, uh, very reasonable rate. Yeah. I mean, it's anywhere from $3 to $50, but you know, it's three, 10 and uh, 25 and 50, but $50 gets you everything, including VIP tickets and all that stuff when COVID's over and we all get back to, you know, work. Uh, but you get essentially everything, you know, in the $25 level, I'll be your producer, you know, uh, I'll get, lend my ear to your so demos and that kind of stuff, $25 a month, you know, but $3 a month gets you all the concerts and everything, you know, and it's like, yeah, why not? And it's supporting artists, you know, and that's the most important thing. Like this has been a really hard time for not just myself, but listen, there are a lot of artists out there who are struggling much worse than I am. That's for sure. So it's a great place to uh, support your favorite artists. Cause you know, streaming, it's like, I got to check. I got to have 4 million streams of the freshman. I got to check for $200. Oh my you know God. What I mean? So you go, well, <laughs> you can't make a living at that. Yeah. And so if I've got it bad with 4 million streams, imagine these young bands or these bands that have been around that don't get those kinds of screams aren't screen uh, streams aren't making anything, you know? So. Anyway. Well, make sure you check out uh, Brian, Brian's uh, Patreon page. And uh, the, the last thing, uh, I know you've having maybe having some minor voice issues, but I wanted to see if you uh, would play a song on the show here. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, man. Of course, one of my kids had the acoustic. <laughs> oh, do they? They uh, they play? Just ripped it out of their hands. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They all they all noodle around with it, which is it's nice. I mean, you know, um, my uh, my oldest daughter takes it really seriously. She's she's just great. Um. Yeah. How about um I'll give you a choice. You want freshman or colorful? I'll do either one for you. <clears throat> uh, let's do you know, I feel like everybody would expect a freshman, so let's do colorful. There you go. I love it. The show is over. Close the storybook. There will be no encore. And all the random hands that I have shook will there reaching for the door. I watch their backs as they leave single file. You stood stubborn, cheering all the while. I know I can be colorful. I know I can be gray I know this loser's living fortunate Cause I know you will love me either way Most will be in good for goodness sake but you wouldn't pantomime Oh, and you are more beautiful when you awake Than most are in a lifetime Oh, but through the haze That is my memory Well, you stayed for drama but you paid for a comedy and I, I know I can be colorful 
Ah, I know I can be great I know this loser's living fortunate Cause I know you will love me the way Oh, but look ahead as far as you can see We'll live in drama, but we'll die in a comedy. I know I can be colorful. I know I can be great. I know this loser's living fortunate. Cause I know you will love me. Wow, that was awesome, man! Thank you so much. Come out okay. <laughs> yeah, that sounded great. A bit hurried. <laughs> no, thank you. That was that was great. Uh, well, Brian, uh, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Make sure you check out his uh, Patreon page and and hopefully uh, your book coming out later this year. Yeah, man, I need it to come out. I need it. I need to get that all out of me. <laughs> uh, and Brian, uh, thank you for for coming on. I appreciate it. You bet, Logan. My, my pleasure, man. And we will be right back on the Crash Report. Hang on. We'll see you next time on the Crash Report. While you wait, make sure to like and subscribe to the show, damn it. Thanks for listening.